history of the stock, and but uh, one of the things is that it um, it's mainly about my own past work, several papers which I haven't cited in the um, uh, in the presentation. But if anyone is interested, please write to me, and I'll let you have the papers, uh, or at least the titles of the papers. Um, the um, I do talk about some other papers, including <clears throat> one particularly which has to do with networks. And uh, so I've been told by some of my former students who are working on that particular paper that my presentation is a bit too optimistic and that I leave out things like the presence of multiple equilibria and so on. But uh, um, that's fine. I think the main message is what matters. So uh, the topic is competition and price formation. And um, now let's see if I can get this thing to work. It was working a few minutes ago. Uh, you can just okay. click on this. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, this is a very basic issue in economics. And um, so when you start uh, an economics class in IIM, uh, where I went to IIM Calcutta for a MBA after my physics undergraduate, and you have this standard picture of the demand curve going downwards and the supply curve sloping upwards and intersecting usually at a single point. And that gives the market price and the amount sold. So this is for a single market. And uh, there's a single price that's, uh, that comes out of the intersection and a given quantity. So, um, <clears throat> so this suggests that there is a price and we'll see some instances where this is not true, but well, let's go on. Now we can um, do a lot of analysis with this um, in trade and so on, and I'm not going to do it here. Um, but uh, one of the things that you might ask yourself when you see this picture is what does it really mean and where does it come from? And um, it's supposed to be a composite or an aggregate of individual sellers who decide how much to supply and what prices to uh, set and individual buyers who decide whether to buy or not. And uh, this, depends of, uh, this, this depends on um, uh, their budget constraint. In other words, how much endowment they have with the various goods, what price um, they can obtain for that endowment and so on. Uh, and if, if we are talking about firms, which are also included here, uh, again, um, the firms don't really set prices, they get a price. So from all this, this individual decisions of firms and consumers uh, you get some diagram like this. Actually, you get a, um, a set of markets because <clears throat> the goods could be uh, complements or substitutes or there could be product differentiation and so on. Um, so when I got my doctorate too long ago to mention without, um, anyway, it was uh, a little more than 40 years ago. Um, I remember going for a job talk uh, at Yale and uh, the person who invited me, Martin Schubick, asked me some questions which are quite strange, but uh, one of the questions was, what's the most important unsolved problem in economics? And uh, since I'd read some of his stuff, I knew that the answer he wanted was price formation. So he regarded that as the most important unsolved problem in economics. And at that time, certainly, there was not very much literature of the kind he wanted, for example, on how prices were formed. 
but since then there has been some. So let's move on to that. So the story behind the demand supply curve is that, so, so you have markets for various goods and there's a, a fictional character called the auctioneer who calls out a price or in fact a price vector, one for each commodity. And sellers calculate how much they will sell at that price and honestly reveal it. This is um, an assumption. And likewise, buyers know how much uh, they want to buy at that price. And so they give demands and supplies and these are aggregated together. And if the market clears, there's trade. If it doesn't clear, then the auctioneer calls out another price and you go through this process again. So that uh, no trade takes place except at the equilibrium price. Um, and when trade takes place, market clearing has a more um, uh, complicated uh, definition if you have multiple markets, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so excess supply means the price is zero and excess demand um, um, so basically well let's just regard it as uh, supply equals demand at some point uh, okay so um, that's the story and uh, the question that uh, so this is sometimes called a generalized game i think there's a paper by de Bruyne in 1952 and uh, um, so he calls it a generalized game. The reason it's generalized and the reason why uh, most game theorists don't like the idea is that the set of actions available to the buyer, for example, depend, uh, that's endogenous. It's not just that the action is chosen by the buyer, but the buyer's choices affect the set of actions from which he or she is able to choose. Um, and the important thing about uh, the story of the auctioneer uh, is that people don't trade except at the single price. Now, the honest revelation uh, assumption also struck me when I first started, when I took my first economics course at IIM. And um, uh, typically, uh, you would think that uh, maybe the buyer would try to understate demand to try to push the price downwards. But um, in this, no player is assumed to be large enough to affect the market price individually. There is a single market price, which is uh, uh, determined by the auctioneer calling out uh, different prices and so on. So, uh, and no seller or buyer has any market power. So they know that even if they want to, they can't influence the market price, except indirectly if there is no, if there's no clearing of the market, then um, there's no trade. So this is uh, maybe a caricature of uh, uh, the competitive equilibrium that dominated economics for many years. But uh, uh, there, have, there were papers on um, processes to get to the equilibrium and so on, uh, which again relied on somewhat ad hoc um, um, assumptions about how prices changed with supply and demand. Uh, by the way, the ad hoc, as, as you don't know, the phrase ad hoc is meant to be a term of abuse in economics, but uh, I'm just using it descriptively, uh, not, not as a term of abuse. Okay, so that's other models of markets which I won't go through. There's a Cournot model in the 1830s. And uh, here again, the demand curve was uh, given. There was a single market price, there was a homogeneous commodity, finite number of players, and um, 
Uh, it has some similarities to the notion that Nash uh, formalized the Nash equilibrium, but it's different because Cournot had a, a process in which players stuck to what they had chosen the last period. And then he looked at the convergence of that process. And Nash recognized that you could um, um, basically have a concept that was similar even for a single period in which there was no, um, uh, no um, revision and so on. Then uh, there was a criticism of that by Bertrand in which sellers called out prices. And this was uh, what I would call a bazaar model in that the prices were public and announced. And again, you got a single equilibrium price. Um, <clears throat> if there are no capacity constraints, if there are capacity constraints, you might get a mixed strategy, but that's um, the main, main model of Bertrand was a single price. So here's an example of how that works in the real world, so-called. And um, this is a book written by my late wife called Merchants, Politics and Society in Early Modern India, Bihar. And uh, so this is a long time ago. You can look this book, you see 2014, but if you look this book, uh, look up this book on a website like this book finder, uh, you'll notice here are the new books. And uh, book finder was owned by a books and then bought by Amazon. So, um, so you notice there's one hundred and thirty nine dollars in one end, and so if you keep going, here's one hundred and eighty four, hundred and eighty eight, and it goes up to I think two twenty nine. So that doesn't seem like a single price, right? And these are new books, unmarked, excellent condition, and so on, and. Uh, What's even more interesting is if you look at the used books. So you notice that this particular used book costs more than the cheapest new book and several other new books. Uh, these two are probably the same book, but they're listed under different sellers. Anyway, so, uh, so if you go through, here's something uh, Herb Tandry philosophy books charges over 200. Here's Herb Tandry again with 265 and so on. So, um, so the new book prices are 139 to 229. And let me get this up here. And the used book prices are 158 to 344. Now, uh, it's hard to explain why this is the case. You might say that the use prices reflect some potential product differentiation because uh, there could be some used books that are in tatters and others that are almost new. Most of them have annotations and so on. Um, but in any case, if that's the case, if they are annotated or whatever, they shouldn't be priced at a higher price than uh, the new books. So, um, but what explains the variation in the new book prices? There, there's no product differentiation because I don't believe there was a paperback of that book. It was published by a Dutch publisher, uh, which um, generally um, priced uh, its uh, products quite uh, at quite a high rate. Um, so uh, this doesn't look like a single price. And um, one of the questions that arises is why is there this price dispersion? And that's not the focus of the talk today, but it's worth checking to see if you have an explanation of this. 
Um, another um, example is, uh, of price dispersion was pointed out by Ashenfelter, uh, I think. Um, <clears throat> and this is the called the declining price anomaly in wine auctions. And identical cases of wine are auctioned off and the price in earlier auctions is higher than in later auctions. It's important that they're identical. And um, so there was more here, but I think I lost it anyway. So, um, so what are the reasons this happens? And my own explanation, though I haven't modeled this, is that uh, it has to do with search costs. So maybe, um, so if, if you're a sophisticated seller, then you look at a site like the one we looked at and say, okay, I can buy the, the cheapest um, price is $139 and I can buy that at that price. But uh, if you are, for example, uh, just click on Amazon.com or Abe Books or whatever and look for the book there and buy it at whatever the price uh, you see there, then um, um, the seller knows that you're not going to search and you're one of the few people who's decided to come to his or her site first. And so maybe he charges more than... Um, he would under perfect competition. Um, the uncertainty about quality is another issue that you may be, if you've gone to Amazon, you know that the book gets to your uh, address in um, some period of time. If you go to somebody else, uh, it may not happen. So um, I had an experience with ordering online. I ordered a book called on graph theory actually. And so instead got a book on vector calculus, which I didn't need. Uh, and um, I think this was from Amazon actually, from their marketplace, not from Amazon itself. Um, so uh, then I sent it back, met it again, uh, the second time again, it came back, the same book, the Vector Calculus book. Uh, and it was the third time round that I decided to order from someone else and got the correct book. So anyway, so uh, that kind of uncertainty about what you're going to get might drive people to buy from the same seller. So there's a reputation model. And again, not one that uh, we're going to check. Now the declining price and wine auctions I'm not going to talk about. Um, there's been something written on it and it's interesting that it's not just about wine, but in Australia apparently commercial properties are also sold by auction. And similar phenomena have been observed there. Um, so anyway, so what we want to know is um, the Schubic question, price formation, and how are prices formed? Under what circumstances do we get one price? So uh, uh, the three most common ways in which prices are set, I would think, are um, posted prices, as in that book example we saw in which sellers post prices and uh, you have to take it or leave it. If you're a potential buyer, uh, I presume you could negotiate if they're individual sellers, but uh, most of the time, if you're trying to buy from Abe Books, for example, you just have to take the price that they post. Uh, or you could have auctions, as in the example of the wine, in which cases of wine are sold at auction. Um, or you could have bargaining. And usually bargaining takes place with um, a buyer and a seller getting together and negotiating 
what price is going to be. And price is not the only thing. There might be other aspects as well, but certainly price is an important uh, factor in whether the bargaining ends in an agreement or not. So these are three possible ways in which prices are formed. And um, so I won't talk much about auctions because most people have been talking about it. Um, you probably will, if you haven't heard a talk on auctions in this series yet, I'm sure you will at some point or the other. And auctions are used in many different uh, settings. Um, wine, we saw houses, tulips, the radio spectrum, uh, eBay, sells online with something resembling a second price auction. And uh, one of the main assumptions about the auction format is that there's a commitment by the seller to the mechanism. Now, the seller doesn't call one of the bidders and say, okay, actually, I can sell it to you for this price. Uh, Sometimes they do. I mean, sometimes you notice that there's a posted price, especially on online auctions, you'll see there's a posted price along with um, whatever the bid price is at that time. And you can choose to buy it at the posted price and forgo bidding in the auction. It's usually higher than the current auction price. But... Um, I know of somebody who got the phone number of the seller, not the auction site, but the actual seller, and called that person and asked him, how many of these objects do you have? And when's the next one coming on the market? So some uh, variation is not permitted, but at least not observed and can't be deterred. Okay, so here's an example of an auction now with two auctioneers, each selling one good. So maybe each of them is selling a copy of that book. And neither seller wants to keep the book. They're not interested in the East India Company or whatever, or late Mughal rule in uh, Bengal. And suppose there are four buyers, the value is being five, eight, nine, or 10. And uh, so this means that um, that's, these values mean that this is the most that buyer won. Five is the most the buyer one is willing to pay for that object. And eight, nine, 10 are similar quantities for buyers two, three, and four. Um, now, what happens? Well, it depends on uh, which auction site attracts which buyer. So suppose the first three buyers go to auction site one and the second, the last buyer goes to auction site two. So with no reservation prices, the player who goes to auction site two can charge, a, can uh, bid one cent uh, or a minimal amount and will get the object because there are no other bidders. Uh, and over here, the price will be eight. If these three players go to auction site one, and then the highest bidder wins. The, uh, the highest bidder knows that she doesn't need to bid any more than eight, maybe a little bit more. Uh, not, and so the price is eight. Now, uh, you could set a reserve price of eight. In, uh, so in this case, there's not a single price. Now, if um, especially the second buyer set a reserve price of eight, then you would get a single price in both auctions. You'd get eight as the single price. So, uh, um, so again, the particular institution and in, even in auctions matters on whether you get a uniform price, even for a single good. Now, if you have multiple goods, of course, there are other considerations. Um, <clears throat> there's been some work on what are called secret reserve prices. 
And secret reserve prices are essentially not reserve prices at all. Because if the seller can change them, the seller is not committed to keep them, even if uh, there's a bid that's higher than the seller's value and lower than the set reserve price, the seller can choose to accept that bid. Um, so there's, uh, so that's, with competing auctions, you get different results on whether you get a single um, price or not. So now let's go to bargaining, which is basically what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. And um, so there's a question about why um, bargaining is used at all. Why don't people play, uh, pay, uh, just use, why don't sellers just use auctions? So one example is that in the auction site where you have only one bidder, auctions are not a very good mechanism for the seller because the bidder can end up paying close to zero or whatever the reserve price is. And um, if you're committed to sell it at whatever the highest bid is, <clears throat> you presumably will have to do that. Um, but most of the time, uh, there are various other aspects to the negotiation apart from um, the price. And if you negotiate uh, a job with some firm or if firms um, <coughs> work with each other to uh, sign a contract on supply, then there are various other, or um, on a house or something, if two individuals contract on a house, there are many other things that are involved. And in the case of firms, uh, there are often releases of information. So somebody buying some product from a potential seller needs to reveal something about the product which might not be public. And this exchange of information might affect the buyer's um, payoff later if it becomes too widespread. So uh, trying to keep the information as proprietary as possible might involve that you sit down away from the public eye. Um, so this is from the seller's point of view, but what about the buyer? The buyer might not um, uh, want to get into auction. Well, uh, yeah, let me leave this out because this will take too long to explain. But um, the main thing about this bargaining is that it's not really bilateral because it's not an auction, but a single buyer and a single pair, play, uh, sorry, a single buyer and a single seller transact in the presence of alternatives. And so in some sense, this takes place in the shadow of the market. Now, what is the market? So it's not the uh, simple one where there's a supply curve and a demand curve, or where an auctioneer calls out prices. Uh, it might not even be a physical marketplace or bazaar. And uh, typically what a market means is that if you don't make an agreement with your current bargaining partner, you can go somewhere else and get something similar. So it's alternatives. And usually in most modern industrial marketplaces, there's not, um, uh, there's usually a small number of alternatives on either side. So firms have an effect on the price. So it's not that each agent is negligible. It's so small that it cannot individually affect the market outcome. But the agents could be large firms if they're engaging in these bilateral deals. And here's an example which I've used in many papers and it's not a, um, it's an interesting example. There's a book on it actually. 
And this is about industrial gases in the 1980s. And uh, what, they, uh, what the industrial gas companies wanted to do was to um, store the gases at the site of the consumers. And um, so this is on-site production and separation of gases. And for this, they needed something, um, uh, differential rates of adsorption. Uh, so I've forgotten my chemistry, but adsorption, I think, means sort of the same thing as absorption, but somebody might um, correct me. But anyway, so chemical companies had the adsorption technology and industrial gas producers had the use for it. So industrial gas producers were the buyers and chemical companies were the sellers. And these, are, these were big companies. So there was British Oxygen, Dow Chemical, then Air Liquide, and DuPont, and Air Products. Air Products was the American one. And British Oxygen was of course British and Air Liquide was French. So there were basically three buyers and three sellers and they started negotiating with each other and uh, some negotiations broke off. I've forgotten exactly. Um, I think Air Liquide started with Dow, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, you could look at the book. <coughs> so you could think of this as the buyers and sellers of technology were both competing with each other. Um, so there was competition for bargaining partners. And um, in the car industry, for example, there was um, a joint venture between Toyota and GM, which was terminated in June 2009. Um, but first Toyota and Ford uh, negotiated and couldn't come to an agreement and then Toyota went with GM and I don't know what Ford did but anyway. So I'll talk a bit about two papers that have dealt with um, this kind of example and let's um, just focus on price because that is our focus in this talk which is to talk about a single price. So here's an argument that says that even though you don't have the requisites of the perfect competition story, the price in all the different agreements must be essentially the same. So if not, suppose a buyer in one agreement is paying a higher price than a buyer in another. And uh, suppose uh, the, uh, the goods that are being sold are homogeneous. So the buyer who's paying more and uh, the seller who's getting less can get together. And uh, if the prices are public, that's another thing which um, you have to think about. So there must be perfect information about the prices. Then they should get together and team with each other. Um, so uh, a market in which different transactions are taking place at different prices is not stable in some sense because buyers and sellers, if they know the price is being paid, can switch partners. And so in equilibrium, the prices must be the same. So is uh, what is the equilibrium concept? So that's something which we can talk about, but um, any reasonable equilibrium should have this property is what people who make this argument would say. I'm not sure anybody has actually made this argument. So this might be a straw man, but, uh, but uh, one could talk about this as a folk argument of some kind. Anyway, is this intuition enough? Is this a proof? In other words, that there's a single market price even though trading is decentralized. And um, so this is what I think is the business school's contributions to economics 
which started in the mid 1970s, in that there was a focus on what do people actually do? And how do what they do lead to a particular outcome? And the process of agreement uh, is usually um, modeled through a game. And um, so typically, the, it's an extensive form game. So I think the other form of game, the strategic form, is a special case. But anyway, um, now it turns out that uh, it matters what extensive form game is chosen. In uh, one, we can prove that this intuition is true. You get the same price, but in the other, it's not. And so this suggests that the process, the way you bargain matters, the level of information matters, and uh, also whether uh, values are the same or not from different participants in the market, that also matters. And different processes are associated with different real world environments. So sometimes you get a uniform price and sometimes you don't. So it's not a law for single price, which is the way it's often referred to. Um, uh, so here's a model. I wonder whether I should go to the, uh, so here's the, before I go to the previous slide, there's a famous a model of bilateral bargaining under complete information due to Rubinstein. So one can think of this as one buyer and one seller. And uh, uh, so what Rubinstein shows is that there's a unique subgame perfect equilibrium solution to the game that he models. And uh, subgame perfect equilibrium is basically a Nash equilibrium that satisfies credibility constraints of the equilibrium path. That's probably not very illuminating, but um, something that you will come across if you haven't come across already. Uh, this is where the historians at the RC Dutt lecture looked really upset, but anyway. Um, so uh, in his case, uh, each player makes, uh, so the first player, say player one, makes an offer, which is a division of the surplus, and player two accepts or rejects. If player two rejects, then player two makes an offer. And the easier version of his uh, paper has discounting. So that's where the uniqueness result is uh, most appropriate. So with discounting, um, that means the next period you lose some time and therefore some part of the payoff. And so then the other player, whoever player two, say the buyer offered in player period one, so the seller offers in period two, and so on. Then the buyer offers in period three and it goes on. And there's a unique solution to this game in which agreement takes place in the first period. And if the discount factor is the same, and let's suppose that that's the case. Um, in that case, there's the solution is essentially splitting this as the discount factor goes to one, as discounting disappears, the solution is splitting the surplus in half. So if you have two different bargains and one has, uh, so the buyers are the same, have the same value V. In the first bargain, the sellers have value C1, and in the second, they have value C2. And C1 and C2 are different. Then the division of the surplus will be different. And the prices will therefore be different. So, um, but this has, this is if there are two independent bargains. So how do we incorporate this? Well, suppose that you consider a setup with two buyers and two sellers. So two is chosen because it's the first number that's greater than one, first integer. So each seller owns only one good. Each buyer is willing to pay up to V for the good. 
and production is on order, which means that the seller incurs the cost only if there's uh, the buyer buys. And seller one chooses C1, seller two, C2. I'm sorry, not chooses. This, these are the given costs with C1 less than C2. The surplus is higher with seller one. So suppose you do a variant of Rubinstein and say that the seller, buyers simultaneously make offers first, the sellers simultaneously accept or reject the offers after they know what they are. Now, uh, you could make these public offers so that it's like a bazaar, or you could make them private offers in which the buyers seek out sellers and make individual offers, or it could be something in which the offers are individual, but uh, other players know what they are. So there are different informational assumptions. And if anyone is left in the market next period, the sellers, now the sellers make offers, so it's alternating. And there's discounting, so it's better to agree earlier than later. So, um, so what happens here, to cut a long story short, um, uh, in, in this case, you uh, in subgame perfect equilibrium, you don't get a uniform price. And the reason you don't, the intuition, rather than going through what I wrote here, this will be available so you can read it if you feel so inclined, uh, is essentially the Rubinstein uh, result in that uh, if some seller is getting uh, a bad deal, then that seller can just wait. Uh, and have the other pair leave the market, in which case they play a Rubinstein game. So the Rubinstein game one period later is sort of a benchmark which things have to satisfy. And since the Rubinstein game gives different prices, it makes agreeing on the same price if delta, the discount factor is close to one, uh, very un unusual. So uh, here the prices are um, different and uh, also it won't be, there won't be agreement at the same period, in the same period. So one of the pairs will agree in the second period. So this is one version where the uh, subgame perfect equilibria uh, also in the private offers case, the only case where sometimes you get a single price is the bazaar case. Um, but in general, you don't get a single price and there's an agreement is delayed. So I'm going to skip the example um, and the details. So let me look at uh, the only paper that I'm going to talk about, which is um, not mine. It's a very nice paper by uh, someone named Margarita Coromina's Bosch. And uh, she says in her paper that having read ours, the earlier one described, she was convinced that heterogeneous players was not going to yield a solution. So what she did was she considered homogeneous individuals. So all buyers have the same V value greater than zero and all sellers have the identical cost also greater than zero and less than V. So uh, we could normalize V minus C as one. So every pair, if they agree, gets the identical surplus of one. Um, so the, uh, the form she uses is more like the bazaar case in which buyers post prices simultaneously, sellers simultaneously accept or reject. There's some rationing involved if, um, uh, I'm so, well, I should shut this off because the lawn is being mowed outside. And uh, anyway, so um, 
So buyers post prices simultaneously, sellers accept or reject. If more than one seller accepts the same offer, uh, there's some centralized rationing scheme. And if they agree, then buyers and sellers leave. Then sellers post prices and so on. So she considers a different aspect that we didn't, and that is uh, there are network constraints. So sellers and buyers can only trade if they're linked. And the links uh, form what is called a bipartite graph. And uh, on, only buyers and sellers can link. Buyers cannot link to one another. So there's no collusion that's permitted and sellers cannot link to one another either. So uh, the question that Corominas Bosch asks and partially answers is that under what conditions will we get what she calls the standard solutions? So if there are equal numbers of buyers and sellers, each gets half the surplus, a la Rubinstein, and otherwise the short side gets the entire surplus. So in other words, if there are more buyers than sellers, then the sellers essentially get the entire surplus of one and the buyers get zero. So this is what she called the standard solution. And this is compatible with the competitive solution as well. So um, in both cases, you get a uniform price in all transactions. Now, I haven't stopped for questions. Are there any? Maybe I'll do that at uh, the end. So, yeah, so you can do that at the end. There's one question uh, which was asked. Uh, that was regarding when you first uh, shown your example of the book, the book yeah. prices. Uh, so there was a question uh, from Marrakesh, Morocco. Uh, so the question is that uh, the reason behind the price, uh, price variation can be delivery cost or delivery charge. So he's just wondering if uh, that has anything to play or that can be a part of this model. Uh, so that's actually included in the price. Uh, if you click on one of the sellers, you'll say, say $139. It says 136 plus 399 delivery. So, um, you might get high delivery uh, charges if, um, for example, you can buy a book from India in the United States and there the delivery charges might be higher. Of course, they can just incorporate it in the price of the book, which would, um, which would work. And I have bought books from India uh, online as well, or from other countries. Um, but in that example, in that example, these prices are, are not including of the delivery charge, right? That's just the price of the book. No, I think they are inclusive of the delivery okay. charge. Okay. 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 Uh, you can check some other book and see, and if you click on one of the sellers, they'll tell you how much they charge for delivery. It's included yeah. in the price. Yeah, yeah. So that's okay. the fixed part of the price uh, price model, pricing model. That, 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 that is something that cannot be uh, changed. Uh, the delivery price. No, I think it can actually. I mean, there are people who charge exorbitant prices for delivery. They make their money that way. <laughs> but, okay, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you call it delivery, then people think, okay, well, this is fixed, as you just said. So, um, if you buy from an, in anyway, I won't get into that book. Uh, lots yeah, of stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's um, carry on. Yeah. Okay, so the, um, so Corominas Bosch basically looked at sellers and buyers can only trade if they're linked. And under what conditions will we get the standard solution? So um, her result, and this is where my current student says I'm giving a, an optimistic picture, which you showed, but um, I mean, there are many other things. This is not completely decentralized because she says so herself. 
that she chooses something that maximizes the number of matches. And um, this is not the only subgame perfect equilibrium. There are other equilibria and so on. But uh, the result that she has is very nice, See, even though it may not be as strong as it's made out to be here. And uh, so she uses a theorem in graph theory called Hall's marriage theorem. And uh, here it's men and women. And um, so when would a subset of K uh, men get married? And so one of the things that they, uh, it has to be that these K men have to know at least K women, assuming that that's what we're looking at, yeah, men and women marriage. Uh, so that sounds plausible. The thing is that it, the important thing about Hall's theorem is that it goes the other way. That's a necessary and sufficient condition. So it's, um, it's sort of a surprising theorem, but um, so I'm not, I wonder how much, so I'll just give you an example of so, uh, Professor Chatterjee, before before you just uh, move on, uh, Professor Shurojit Borkotoki from Dibrugarh University, Assam, have asked a question. So, he's asking yes. that, uh, can the price drop in the newer edition influence? In the book question? I think so, yes. Um, the price can drop if it's a paperback, for example. Or... Um, Sometimes for these academic books, uh, there are international editions uh, that are published. So this is not the case in uh, the book that I mentioned. So okay. EJ, EJ Brill, which was the publisher, told my late wife that uh, we don't publish cheap versions and we're doing something right because we've been in business since 1683. Okay. Uh, um, they were in, I wonder if they're still in business, but in any case, the problem was that the book was over at India and very few people in India could afford the price that they were, their posted price. So right. th there were other ways in which um, people got to read the book. Sure. So sure. anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you can move on. Yeah, yeah, please, please carry on. So um, here's an example where um, so I don't know why there's so many grammatical errors in this part, but anyway. Um, so here the short side gets one in either case. So here the buyer is the short side and uh, here are the sellers. And uh, so in this case, you notice that there's a deficiency, what uh, Hall calls the deficiency and Coromino's bot. And here's, uh, this is not what I want. So what do I do here? There should be a. Uh, so, yeah, maybe rotate yeah. view. Yeah. Counterclockwise. Yes. Okay, so here's an example where two sellers are linked to a single buyer and the buyer gets everything or in the other case, the seller gets everything. Um, so here's another case in which, um, so here, this is the complete graph in which everyone is linked to everyone else. And here's a, an N graph, it turns out the laterally inverted N is sort of very difficult to handle. But this particular N, the um, satisfies the conditions of Hall's theorem. Uh, each seller, each subset of sellers, one knows at least one buyer and um, And each buyer knows at least one seller. So 
there's no deficiency in this case and so you'll get um, um, the Rubenstein solution. So again, it'll be a uniform price. So you get half in each case. So the benchmark equilibrium is this. Um, and um, so this is different, by the way, from older papers, including by Rubenstein himself and Walensky and by Douglas Gale and others in which, uh, in Rubenstein and Walensky, uh, each pair that left were replaced by someone else. So you essentially had an infinity of players. So it was hard to say who was on the short side and who was not. So, um, so the question is whether um, this holds for different markets in which some heterogeneity. But before that, the result that she gets is um, which types of network will support the benchmark solution. And so this means that it's the structure of who can communicate with whom who determines whether there's a uniform price or not. And the other question is which of these networks will only support the benchmark solution, so the uniqueness of equilibrium. So here are some other results with um, other markets. And here you notice Here's one graph in which there are two buyers and three sellers, but the buyers don't get everything. And this is because this buyer knows only one other seller. So as Delta becomes large, the seller will essentially um, hold, not accept anything until she gets this bias. So the Rubenstein solution will be the benchmark. Um, uh, so here are the two decompositions. This is gets into what she does. So I'm out of time. So I'm going to leave this. Okay. Uh, so now let's look back at uh, the earlier framework without network constraint. And um, so this is a recent paper that I wrote with one of my former students. And here, um, this is one of the papers, there were two or maybe three, I don't know, anyway. So um, unlike in the earlier paper, here only one side makes offers, say buyers. And we restrict ourselves to a particular kind of uh, equilibrium, which is called stationary or history independent. And uh, it can also be extended to incomplete information, but we won't talk about that. Um, so two homogeneous buyers with valuation V, each buyer dem demands one unit of the good. Two heterogeneous sellers with valuation H and M, which are different and uh, both are less than V, so gains from agree agreement are positive surplus is common knowledge. The sellers can be identified, so you know who's the SH and who's the SM, and each seller is one unit of the good. So buyers simultaneously make targeted offers, meaning that they offer to a single seller. The offers are public. Here the sellers are different, so that's not a bad assumption. The seller either accepts or rejects the offer she get, gets. Match pair leave the game. Now, remaining players move on to this next period and players discount the future a common delta. So uh, there's a stationary equilibrium which is unique. And what does stationary mean? It means that uh, players have the same expectations for the future no matter what's happened in the past. So anything that's not payoff relevant is ignored in determining the strategy for the future. So uh, the equilibrium is very peculiar. 
but essentially one of the buyers, it need not be one, randomizes between offering to the two sellers. The second buyer makes offers only to the seller with the lower uh, cost. And the first buyer offers H to SH, the seller with the higher cost. And um, there's some PL which, and to the other seller, uh, where did we go? to the other seller buy one offers between PL and H with a mass point at PL, which means that there's a spike uh, of probability at PL. And B2 puts a mass point at M and there's a gap between M and PL. And then there's a continuous distribution of offers from PL to H. So for two buyers and two sellers, this is unique. Um, and for uh, we can extend this to arbitrary number of buyers and sellers that's in, a, in the paper too. So that's uh, without... So just just, just uh, interrupting you once. Uh, so Professor Konan Mukherjee has asked a question uh, that would the result change if buyers are interested in buying more than one object? Uh, yes. I don't know how because we didn't consider that. But definitely. Okay. Uh, one of my students is actually working on that with the Coromina's Bosch model. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, so other possible subgame perfect equilibrium, you can get a non-stationary equilibrium in which buyers collude. And if some buyer deviates from the collusion, then you go to the stationary equilibrium, which is not very good for the buyers because essentially uh, both buyers end up paying, uh, getting an expected payoff, which is um, equal to S, uh, V minus SH. So, or whatever, V minus H, sorry. So I'm not going to discuss this. So in this case, as delta goes to one, offers converge to the higher seller price, even though some transactions are delayed by one period, but essentially the delay goes away as delta goes to one because one period is sort of a uh, very small length. So, um, so here we have convergence as delta goes to one to a uniform price. Now, if you allow buyer collusion and non-stationarity, then prices in different transactions could be different. So even without informational imperfections, this is the conclusion, even without informational imperfections, uh, which leads to phenomena such as search um, or reputation, which is two of the things we mentioned uh, with respect to the books. Um, it's not that the basic intuition of the competitive pressure driving prices to the same value holds always, especially if you have heterogeneity in, in uh, not in the quality of the good, it would certainly hold then, but heterogeneity in the amount that buyers are willing to, or sellers, uh, buyers are willing to pay for the good or how much it costs sellers. And either you have to have uh, with, with homogeneity, I think with heterogeneity also, though she didn't show it, you have Coromina's Bosch's um, result that <coughs> you must have a sufficient number of uh, players of one side of the market being linked to all players of the other side. Or in our case, uh, we get it if only one side makes the offers. So you don't get it if you don't have these network constraints and if you don't have a Rubenstein, uh, and if you have a Rubenstein model where they're alternating offers, in that case, you don't get a uniform price. But with heterogeneity, you get a uniform price if they're one-sided offers. Now, uh, the usual, uh, so one reaction to this would be, do we need to worry about these fine points at all? 
And uh, this has become a sort of criticism of extensive form games is that everything depends on these fine points. But these fine points are important because the different extensive form games correspond to different institutions. There's a very nice paper by Avner Shaked, uh, which he actually published. He used to keep papers and not publish them, but, uh, but it's published in a place where one can't get it. Um, I think I have a copy, so anyone's interested, but he actually shows how different institutions um, correspond to different uh, extensive forms. And um, so in some sense, worrying about these fine points is basically saying that the results will depend on what you're modeling, which institution you're modeling. So I think they're important. And uh, they might have policy implications as well. Um, no, that's not something we worked on. Um, it's something for future research, maybe. Okay, sorry for going over time. Uh, so that's then, that's not a problem uh, at all. So we did not really uh, cross. Uh, so it, it it was for an hour, and so you you were like an hour and two minutes. So you did not, you know, and also there were a couple of questions in between. So it's perfectly fine. So I would ask if uh, any of the participants want to interact with our speaker today, they can raise the hand in Zoom and then I can uh, basically unmute uh, and you can um, have any discussion you want or any questions. So if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask a question. As of now, uh, I don't uh, see anybody. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Indrajit Roy uh, has has uh, asked uh, wanted to ask a question, so I am unmuting uh, Professor Indrajit. Yes, uh, please. Thank you. Hello, Indra. Uh, How are you? Kulanda Indra. Um, yeah. Just uh, wondering, uh, uh, just to clarify, really, uh, you mentioned in somewhere in the middle of your talk, uh, you said there were two different extensive form and one normal form, and um, I was not sure which game you were talking about. Was it separate with market game? I, I was, uh, can you just elaborate if if you can, please? No, uh, that was just a general comment. It was just saying that. Um, we are going to consider extensive form games rather than normal form games. And uh, it would be very difficult to put these infinite, in fact, I don't think it's possible, to put these infinite horizon problems in a normal form. I mean, to actually draw a payoff table. Now you could argue that uh, we could look for Nash equilibrium in these games. In other words, not worry about credibility. Uh, not worry and not require that strategies be equilibria in all sub-games, which is what we do require. Um, that would give more equilibria because in any bargaining problem, if you look for Nash equilibria and not sub-game perfect, even in Rubinstein, you get a continuum of uh, potential agreements as well as perpetual disagreement. So Nash equilibrium is not very um, discriminatory among possible agreements. That's where Rubinstein's um, result offered some hope in that subgame perfect gave a unique solution. But as we saw later, well, even with Rubinstein, there are other issues, but we saw later that um, the uniqueness doesn't hold in general. I mean, maybe if you incorporate, have stationarity or something, then it will hold. I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so I have uh, I, I I have a doubt. So the last uh, paper that you discussed, uh, so mm -hmm. in that there is no network constraints, right? Uh, right. But does that also mean that uh, so size does not uh, make any difference here? The size uh, of the market. Um, it doesn't make a difference to this particular result. That's true. Now, if you have more, uh, if so long as they're equal, the number of buyers and sellers. Now, if you have more uh, sellers than buyers, um, we did do that case, but I've forgotten the result. I would expect that in that case, size would make a difference. Okay, and uh, and also, uh, if if there is uh, seller collusion, then then anything, uh, what, what what happens if if uh, in so, if there's seller collusion, then, for example, the sellers might decide that they're not going to bid against each other. Or, so if there are two sellers and one buyer, uh, then the buyer has the market power in some sense that the sellers will bid the price down to zero. Right. But if they collude, they might say, we are not going to like oil prices in in the distant power the recent past uh, that they're not going to um, lower prices beyond some level so then we do have a single market price right i mean yeah if all the colluders uh, if all the, all the sellers collude yeah uh, with oil prices you notice that there are i mean the reason that collusion broke apart is that who is it? Russia, I think, started uh, cutting prices below. I don't remember uh, the OPEC price, and then Saudi Arabia decided to punish the defectors yeah. in classic cartel um, yeah. fashion. And unfortunately, it misjudged its market power. Yeah. Unfortunately for them. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. But collusion okay. would change things, certainly. Yeah. Um, okay, so anybody else uh, wants to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Else. Uh... Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chatterjee. Uh, for oh, I should say, one, sorry, one thing I should mention, so yeah. that, uh, maybe just a correction, which is that this Institute for Advanced Study, I was a member a long time ago. Okay, okay. It's only for a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so next time we'll... Uh, so, Indrajit? Uh, yes, uh, I'm back. I just remembered I, I did have a comment now that we seem to have spare time to chat and we are not going to a pub after seminar. Uh, uh, I was just wondering if you have noticed Amazon prices never include delivery charges and firms actually use it um, strategically. That is, you are absolutely right, some of the delivery prices are extremely high. So you, you can lower your actual price, you can set 99p or cent, whatever, with a very high delivery price of $10 or 10 pounds. Uh, to become the cheapest, uh, although there are other competitors perhaps are doing free delivery uh, with, let's say, half the price. So, mm -hmm. um, so that is indeed a strategic choice they have, and uh, you are absolutely right that some of them uh, use uh, enormous delivery prices. Just, just a comment. Right. So that's um, in that you find if you're buying online. Uh, you buy anything online, that's a problem. How much they'll charge for delivery. Yeah. And um, so you're not in, sure in what case, you get. It, it, it helps them to become, um, you know, top buyer, top seller rather in terms of prices. If you rank products by price, then one can become most prominent simply by lowering the price but charging 
Uh, yeah, like price uh, should not be. I mean, if price is not a singular entity, and price can be divided into two kinds of prices, but the seller's mm -hmm. ranks are not dependent on both kinds of prices. They are dependent on one kind of price. So there can be a strategic decision based on the division of the price. Right. So um, there, there is a. I think there's more than one paper on this. There's a phenomenon called shrouding. So you see this in I.O. And uh, one paper was by Gabash. Gabash is spelled G-A-B-A-I-X. And, and he had a co-author. Was it Leibson? Maybe it's Gabash and Leibson. Um, Leibson is probably more famous than Gavash, but anyway, yeah. but they, um, um, so anyway, it's not, so this paper basically looks at the practice, they look at New York hotels. So New York uh, hotels, if you, um, um, in the days when you could go to New York, uh, uh, you had to, you could look online and book a hotel, which might say something like $300 a night. And once you tried to book it, you'd find the, it came to closer to $400. So one of the things they left out was the room tax and so on, the local tax. And many of them also had this thing called a resort fee. And, uh, it was not clear what this resort fee was. In one of the hotels, they actually said that between four to six or five to seven, whatever it was, every evening, um, we have free hors d'oeuvres in the dining room. So for that, they charge you $40 a night, so they're hardly free. So uh, this is shrouding, so you don't reveal the true price. And uh, uh, eventually, when you buy, of course, the price has to be revealed, so you don't need to click on uh, on buy. But um, if you think that everyone else is doing the same thing, and it's the same with parking, if you're driving there, and some people would say um, parking is an issue, and some some prices include parking, and others don't. Most of them don't. Um, there's also a paper by Glenn Ellison on a similar topic. I wonder if this is with the two Ellisons, whether it's with Sarah Ellison also, but I've forgotten. Uh, his was a later paper, but I think it was a better one, basically. So <clears throat> this looks at the strategic issue of shrouding. Um, Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, we are at the close of this webinar. Uh, thank you, Professor Chatterjee. And it was actually great. And I don't think uh, you managed to bore anybody this time. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. I hope you I'm had glad. a good practice for your next uh, seminar. Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll be a different paper. That's in August. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so, so great. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this. Uh, we'll uh, come back shortly uh, with our next talk on 2nd June. Uh, the speaker will be Kaushik Basu. And uh, so we'll see you all again. Uh, I'll, I'll, of course, send uh, an invitation email to every one of you. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Chatterjee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.